With three different disciplines and two transitions, there is a lot to learn when it comes to triathlon. It's no surprise that the rule book is pretty full too. So today, we're going to be outlining everything you need to know to get from the start to the finish without falling foul of the referees. Okay, let's start at the beginning with the swim rules. And one of the more obvious ones is water temperature. Now, the majority of races for age group athletes will be wetsuit legal. You'll be allowed to wear your wetsuit. However, do note that pool swims allow no wetsuits, whatever. So there are a few cutoff temperatures to be aware of. For sprint and Olympic distance events, wetsuits are allowed in water up to 22 degrees or 71 Fahrenheit. And for longer distances up to Ironman, you may wear a wetsuit as long as the temperature is below 24 and a half degrees or 76 Fahrenheit. Generally, as a replacement to the wetsuit, athletes will simply just wear their trisuit or potentially a swim skin over the top of their trisuit. And this is obviously not allowed to have any neoprene in it. And it is worth noting that if you're someone who usually wears calf guards under your wetsuit, well, you can't use them if you're not using a wetsuit. Basically, whatever you're wearing must finish just above your elbows and just above your knees. It's also worth noting that professional athletes actually have a lower cutoff than age groupers. So if you see the pros are walking around in their swim skins ahead of your race, don't panic. It might well still be wetsuit legal for you. But it's a good idea the night before to find out what the water temperature is and you'll know if you need to be prepared for it to change. And they'll normally make the final announcement an hour or so before your race. And believe it or not, there is actually a cutoff for lower temperatures. So some people choose not to wear a wetsuit when they don't have to, although most people would prefer the buoyancy from it. And so if the water is 14 degrees or colder, then you have to wear a wetsuit. Regarding kit, there are a few specifics that you need to be aware of. For example, a wetsuit can't be more than five millimeters thick, which if you're using a triathlon specific one, you won't find any that thick anyway. If you are, say, borrowing a surfing wetsuit, it's just something you need to be aware of. And then when it comes to swim caps, they're usually provided by the race organizer and you'll have to wear this on the outside. And I say on the outside, you are still allowed to wear your own cap underneath if you want. So if you want a silicon cap underneath, or if it's fairly cold, you can actually wear a neoprene cap underneath and then the race cap over the top and talking of cold conditions if it is 14 degrees or under where wetsuits become mandatory then you are allowed to wear some sort of neoprene booty or sock sometimes you're allowed gloves but that's normally only in extremely cold triathlons and always check with the race organizers and finally you're not allowed any extra pieces of kit which probably isn't a surprise like you can't have paddles or fins or music or a metronome basically it just needs to be you your wetsuit and your swim cap now into the transition area and there are quite a few vital rules to learn here the first one being the helmet rule make sure you've put your helmet on and got it done up before you remove your bike from the bike rack and the same goes at the other end so when you bring your bike back in to transition make sure it's racked and fully supported before you undo your helmet strap and take your helmet off that's just a vital rule another really important one is to remember the mount and dismount line so you can push your bike through the transition area but you cannot get on on it until you've passed the mount line. Now there'll usually be plenty of officials standing there and the line is pretty clear but it's still a good idea to check the day before or that morning exactly where that line is and even more so the dismount line because you might be coming in quite fast thinking about your transition and that line can creep up on you pretty quickly and you need to make sure you have got off your bike before you cross over that line. And then there's your actual kit that you have in transition and each event will differ depending on the organizer. Ironman, for example, have actual transition bags where you put all your kit in and that's normally at a separate area away from your bike, whereas smaller events sometimes will even provide you with a box or you simply put your stuff on the ground. But it's up to you to respect your neighbor's space and make sure you keep your kit tidy. You're also not allowed to have anything that stands out or is too obvious, so it makes it unfair for you being able to find your bike more easily than others. Onto the bike now, and this is the largest portion of the triathlon event, and as a result, there's more rules to remember here. And the first up is safety when it comes to your bike. You need to make sure it's in good working order as much for yourself as for the organizers. So as you come into the bike racking area, there usually should be someone just checking that your bike is working properly and that your front and your back brakes are in good condition. And should you suffer with any mechanicals out on the course, well, it's thought that you should be self-sufficient. So making sure you're carrying enough spares for anything basic, such as a puncher, and also having the skills to repair it. 
The majority of age group triathlons are non-drafting, therefore you need to be aware of the drafting distance and it's measured from the front wheel of your bike to the front wheel of the bike in front of you and it's usually a minimum of 10 meters for short distance events and it goes up to 12 meters on the long distance events but it is always worth checking the rules because it can be as little as seven right up to 20 meters for that distance and then so you know that but then you need to obviously sometimes overtake people and this is where it gets a little bit tricky so it's a good idea to imagine a box so you've got the length of the box but the box is also one and a half to two meters wide and when you go to overtake somebody you're going to be entering into this box and in theory you've got to keep progressing forwards and you have 20 seconds when it's a short distance race or 25 seconds when it's a long distance race in which to from entering the box to pass the rider in front of you and this is what the draft busters will be looking for so the referees out on the motorbike will be keeping an eye potentially even looking at their clock as you're overtaking someone to make sure that you're not tucking in or taking advantage of that rider in front of you and it's really worth being aware of this rule because you will get pulled up on it and it can be a penalty from two minutes right up through to five minutes. And then there are a few things to bear in mind that are rules, but they're also there for safety. And this is where you're actually positioning yourself on the road. So obviously if you're riding in the UK, you're gonna be on the left-hand side of the road. In the US or the rest of Europe, you're going to be on the right-hand side. But within that, you need to make sure that you're staying away from the middle of the road. Because if you are riding close to the middle, that can be seen as blocking, so stopping another athlete coming through. And the only way for them to get past you would be to go over the white line, which is a disqualifiable offense. So you need to just make sure you keep on your side and just stay out of the way. And talking of disqualifiable offences, littering is high up there. So you need to make sure that everything you have on you, on the bike, in your pockets, remains with you until the end of the race, unless you're going through a drop zone. So some races, Ironman for example, will have an area in which you can drop your rubbish, but anything outside of that, well, you could be disqualified. All right, now we're out onto the run, it's the home straight, but there's still a few rules to be aware of and a couple that are a little bit quirky. Say you're racing somewhere really hot, well, it might be tempting to simply take your tri-suit top off and just run bare-chested. That is not allowed in pretty much any place, so just remember that one. I think there's a certain distance which you're allowed to undo your zip to, but just make sure you check that one. And then there's outside assistance. You might have your friends and your family all there supporting you, maybe your coach, and you're in between eight stations and they've got a water bottle there. You can't take that water bottle or a gel or anything from any spectators as that's seen to have outside assistance. The same goes with any sort of proven coaching. So if they're giving you any real significant coaching that's more than just come on, you can do it. And that includes running alongside. So if your mum suddenly decides to join you, you've got to tell her she's got to wait until the finish line. And now you are coming up to the finish of your run. We're almost there, literally. But you still have to wait until you've got across that line before you can be joined by your children, your family, or anyone for some hugs and high fives. So make sure you get through the finish shoot, cross the line, and then you can hug as much as you want. Well, hopefully this has filled in some gaps around your racing knowledge and got you ready for the season ahead. If you've enjoyed it, remember, please give us a like, follow us on our social media, and why not subscribe to us on YouTube as well?